Well, turn with me to the book of Colossians again this morning. We're going to read in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. Colossians 3, 5 through 17. I'm reading from the NIV 1984 translation. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Bow with me for just a word of prayer. Lord, I ask for your anointing and your filling. Enable me, Lord, to be used by you to speak your words. Please give us an unusual understanding of this passage of Scripture. May your Holy Spirit be here to guide us into truth. And God, give us hearts, hearts that uh, are able to receive and the will to respond with action that is appropriate. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, thus far in this letter, Paul has emphasized time and time again the sufficiency of Christ, the grace of God to us through Jesus. In the first four verses of this chapter 3, Paul tells the people that they, are, they should focus their hearts and their minds on the heavenly realities, on the things that are above. We talked about those things last week, but I want to, if you will, allow me, and you don't have a choice, but uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refresh your memory for just a moment. The heavenly realities. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He has finished his work of salvation. He has accomplished all that's necessary for all those who believe. He is reigning over all things now. That's not a future promise. That is a now promise. It has been all turned over to him. And the evidence of that or the revealing of that will take place when he comes again. And our salvation is completed and it's had nothing to do with us. It's had nothing to do with anyone else or anything else except the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, there is no work we can do to save ourselves. And there is no work we can do to keep ourselves saved. From beginning to end, through and through, it is all about Jesus and what he did for us. The heavenly reality is also the fact that not only is Christ seated at the right hand of God, but we are there hidden in him. 
That's a concept that I can't fully grasp, that I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. But we are hidden with Christ. Uh, If that term is hard to understand, maybe it would be easier if we use another biblical phrase. We are now clothed with Christ. We have taken off our clothes and put on the clothing of Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in Jesus, our old self is removed, and we now have Christ living through us. In fact, earlier, Paul said, Christ is your life. He's our life. That's the heavenly realities. What Paul is going to be saying in these verses, or what he said in these verses today, I think can be simply put like this. Make the heavenly reality your earthly reality. That's that's all he's asking us to do. Since you've already been clothed with Christ in the heavenly realities, since that's what really matters, be clothed with Christ while you're living your life here in this earthly existence. Everything he says in these verses, everything is dependent upon those first four verses that we went over last week, that our minds and our hearts should be focused on the heavenly things, the things above. Everything here is dependent upon that, and that's why Paul begins this section with their four. Because of the heavenly realities, we now have the ability and the desire through the Holy Spirit to accomplish what Paul says here, primarily because we died and Christ now lives through us. As we focus on the heavenly things, I believe what's ha- what happens is the Holy Spirit transforms us. The Holy Spirit converts us. It's a, it's a conversion. That's what we normally call becoming a Christian, a conversion. As we focus on those heavenly realities, the Holy Spirit is constantly working in our life to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. All that he did for us, if we focus on those things, that all that he did has made us who we are in him. And the Spirit is now transforming us to be just like him. When we, when we focus on him, the Holy Spirit changes our desires, changes our goals, changes our behavior. Yes, there is some effort on our part to be holy. But without the understanding of those first four verses, it's futile. It's futile. So, Paul says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That earthly nature really literally means the limbs that are upon the earth. The limbs that are upon the earth. That's pretty fitting because most people think that refers to your body, your earthly body. And it's pretty fitting because he talks about sexual immorality uh, coming up in that first list. Jesus said, if your right arm causes you to sin, what are we supposed to do with it? Yeah, Basically, that's what Paul's saying here. Get rid of those earthly limbs that are causing you to sin. The first list here has to do with sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, this word, is any sexual relation outside of marriage. Primarily sexual intercourse. Sexual immorality is the product of impurity, lust, And the evil desires that he mentions here. And all of them has as their bottom line, greed. Have you ever thought of sexual immorality as greed? Greed is a a craving for something we want that we don't have. And that is the product. That That is that which produces the sexual immoral actions in our lives. We covet for something we don't have, or we covet for more than we have. And Paul tells us very clearly, that's idolatry. Because you are craving something other than God. God is to be our craving. 
Paul doesn't give this, uh, this list to uh, give us another code of conduct, another set of rules to be obeyed if we are really Christian. When, when Paul gives moral uh, lists of moral virtues or, or immoral vices, for that matter, it's in order to describe for the people what the fruit of God's Spirit working in us looks like. For the Colossians, he gives this list in response to the rules of the spiritual umpires that were at Colossae. I got, I got that umpire from one of the commentators. He called them umpires. You know, those people that go around checking on how good you are. Sort of like Santa Claus. You got to do this, 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 and this. And they're, they're in the church and they're, they're always hounding on you. Well, that's these false teachers that were here in Colossae. They were umpires and they were saying, listen, if you aren't circumcised, you're not really a follower of God. If you don't do this and this, if you don't deserve, observe this special day in the religious season, then you're, you cannot be a follower of God. And Paul says that their rules in regard to sexual immorality, their rules lack any power to control their sensual desires. That's what he said in the last verses of chapter 2. So rules have no, no ability to change who we are to keep us from doing that which God does not like. In fact, when we just take rules and add them to a life that is not in relationship with Christ, the thing that rules are designed to stop us from doing is the very thing we do. I hope you have, well, I don't hope you have, but I'm sure if you're like me, you've experienced that in your life. The rules are never enough to change a behavior, for the long term anyway. Only the Holy Spirit within us can do that. You see, the Colossian believers were tempted to submit to rules of self-denial and even self-mutilation as a substitute to devotion to Christ. According to Paul, the acceptance and the participation in the results of Christ's work for us extinguishes the behaviors that those rules can never touch. Have, have you ever had a sin that was hard to overcome? Duh. Have you ever overcome them? I think if you're like me, you will find that you come to a place where you realize it doesn't matter how hard you try. You can't do it. And somewhere in that mix, you, you really give it over to God and say, God, you've said I am holy. You've said I am righteous in Jesus Christ. Help me. For me, it was like, whew, and it went away. Not that it doesn't tempt still, but the ability to overcome had nothing to do with my ability to fight it, but to surrender it. I think that's what Paul is saying here for us. The Colossians used to live that kind of life, but uh, it's not very fitting for them to live that kind of life now that they've come to know Christ. If they simply, listen to this now, if you simply follow a code, code of rules, you will always revert back to an ungodly, earthly lifestyle. Because of this lifestyle, the wrath of God is coming. That word is, uh, is coming like it's, it's already there then and it's continuing to come. I like to think of it in this way. When, when a place becomes so immoral, the wrath of God causes him to remove his hand of restraint. And then he allows people to do things which are actually self-destructive to them. His restraint keeps them. 
and gives them the ability to do what's best for them. But when they choose to reject him and go their own way, he withdraws and it just keeps getting worse. It's not part of this passage, but let me just say this to you. The magnitude and the scope of sexual perversion in our society, I hope it shocks you. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. It is the, the magnitude and the scope of sexual perversion in our society and the mass acceptance of this perversion is a clear indicator that our society has rejected God. And with the way that it is just going worse and worse, I believe God has taken his hand of restraint off. And he's allowing our society and people in our society to self-destruct. We need to pray. So Paul moves on from sexual sin to, that may not be something that, that you know, bothers you that much, but then he moves towards relationships. And uh, the number one thing that reveals hatred or whatnot in a relationship, and that's your, your tongue. Paul's writing to a church. We need to remember that. The teaching of man-made rules, the teaching that we must adhere to the Sabbath day or to this celebration or that celebration, or you can't do this and you can't do that and you must do this, all of those things will only add frustration and stress to your life. If that's the way you're living Christianity, you're probably saying, I was much happier not being a Christian than being a Christian because now i got all these rules I need to obey. Well, if that's your Christianity, you need to come to Christ. Because when you're in that realm, guess what happens to your mouth? Your frustration comes bubbling out. I tell you, I hate to see Christians. I hate to see Christians who are constantly badgering other Christians, who are constantly critical, constantly talking about other people. It happens. And it happens because we have so many people who call themselves Christians today who are still living according to the earth. One commentator said the primary fruit of an individual's faith is how the believer relates to others who belong to the congregation of God's people. When the Holy Spirit is working within you, you are a child of God. And when the Holy Spirit is working in you, he's going to make you get along in the family. That's what he desires. There were obviously some divisions here in Colossae, probably due to the false teaching, probably due to some people receiving special attention and others didn't receive special attention. The speech referred to here is probably because of those divisions. They were angry at each other. Therefore, Paul says, here, in, in this body of Christ, in this family of God, in this local church, there is no Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised or barbarian or Scythian or slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. In Christ, all are equal in value. Now, that doesn't mean we're all equal in role or task. I'm a firm believer that God has assigned the roles of men and women, and we shouldn't mess with that. But that doesn't mean we're not equal in value. We are equal in value. The Church of Jesus Christ is to be characterized by unity and love, and that doesn't mean that we will always agree. We will disagree. But we will love each other in the process. If we disagree, we can love in the process. So that our disagreement doesn't cause division. I'm afraid the church by and large has failed at this, wouldn't you? We have not shown the grace of God to the world because we have not loved each other as we should. Too many churches are just, they're, they're more stressful than the world for most people. 
Okay, so to this point, Paul's been negative. Now he's going to be positive. And he begins with this. God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved. You know what he's doing there? He's pointing us back to verses 1 through 4. This is the heavenly reality. I'm God's chosen person. So are you. I am holy. Whew. I would not describe myself as holy. That's the earth. But in the heavenly realities, I'm holy. I'm righteous through Jesus Christ. And I am dearly loved. That's who we are, folks. When we can live with that confidence, it changes our life. To live the heavenly realities on the earth today. He goes from there and he defines this transformation that grace works in our life. Notice again, these all have to do with relationships. There's five of them. People, most commentators I read said there's no, there's no real need to define these. This, this list of five overcomes the lists of fives in the negative realm. If these things happen, we don't have to worry about those other ones. And notice that these five are, it's not a list of things to do. It's not a list of things to do. It is a list of character traits that the Holy Spirit produces within you. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. They marked the church's life. Jesus himself self said, the world will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And that's true. People become convinced of or turned off to the gospel when they see what happens inside a church. I think most people have been turned off by most churches. I've been turned off by most churches. We will never be that church, right? We will always have love, even in our disagreements. Do you know what to bear with one another means? <laughs> It means to put up with a person who rubs you the wrong way. Do you ever have anybody that rubs you the wrong way? I mean, we always do. Our personalities just don't always fit, do they? So Paul says we are to bear with each other. Put up with those folks that rub you the wrong way. But it's more than just put up with. When we have the grace of God working in our life, that grace causes us to be willing and even desire to be vulnerable to that person who rubs us the wrong way so that where there is once frustration or that friction now becomes a place of intimacy and true love. God's grace does that as we allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And Jesus here says, forgive, or Jesus said prior Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. But Paul says, forgive because you have been forgiven. Because you have been forgiven, forgive. Listen, there is no way. There's no way if we're honest with ourselves and honest with God. There's no way I can look at my life and then look at someone else and say, I've got the right not to forgive you. There's no way I can look at what, at where I'm seated now in the heavenly realms, declared to be holy, completely forgiven of every stupid sin I've ever committed in my life, and then be able to say, I'm not willing to forgive you. Now remember, forgiveness, there's a lot involved in forgiveness. It's not as black and white all the time as most people say. If you go back and listen to that sermon on forgiveness way back there. But my heart has always got to be willing and ready at a moment's notice to say, yes, I forgive you. It always has to have that, that, that um, forgiveness as, uh, in the root of my soul toward that person. Always. No resentment, no bitterness. Don't allow it to take root. 
Love is all-encompassing. Agape love, self-denial. It is the fruit of faith in Jesus Christ. And again, love brings us all together in unity. And he keeps on going. This is quite the passage. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. The peace of Christ. Romans says that we are now at peace with God through Jesus Christ. That peace we have because of what Jesus has done for us is the same peace that we should give to each other. We are not here to be the umpire of each other's spiritual walk as far as man-made rules are concerned. I don't care if you wear a tie. I don't care if you wear shorts. I don't care what you wear to church as long as it's halfway decent. I'm not going to judge you by that. And I pray nobody else judges anyone by that. I don't care if you have tattoos or you don't have tattoos. I don't care. Those are man-made rules. As I said before, I don't care what color your hair is. I don't care if you have hair at all. I don't care if you say the King James Version is the best Bible ever. I don't care if you think the NIV is the best Bible ever. It doesn't matter. We're not judging each other on these man-made rules. I don't care what you do on a Sunday afternoon. If it's, if it's something that you shouldn't be doing, then you shouldn't be doing it any other day either. We cannot judge each other on those things. We must allow the peace that God has given us, salvation through Christ and Christ alone, to be extended to everyone else. And that will produce unity among us. I think verse 16 has to do with worship. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and gratitudes in your hearts to God. Here we are living in this community of believers and we're all focused on the heavenly realm, reality, the fact that we are all one in Jesus Christ. We're all seated together with him in Christ, hidden in him. He is our life. How can we not come together and worship? I mean, it's pretty incredible what God has done for us, is it not? He's taken those of us who could not do anything but sin, and he's made us righteous in the eyes of his heavenly Father. What is the word of Christ that needs to dwell in us? Well, I think it goes back to uh, chapter 1, verse, 15, verse 5, which is the word of truth. And the word of truth is defined as the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to allow the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God in Christ, to determine, to, to penetrate, to fill, to, to surround everything we teach and admonish one another with. It must be the core of everything we teach. And the same is true with the music. All the music, all the words to the music, they must... They must be able to um, line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I, don't, I really don't believe there's any need to identify all those. It's whatever the Spirit of God causes us to sing. Those are the things that we are to sing to the Lord. And let, let me just say this. There's so much we could say about worship today, but um, I just want to make a few points. First, teaching, preaching, and admonishing is as much worship as music. Okay? Music has become the worship of the church. That's dangerous. Especially when a lot of music isn't gospel sound. And we need to be careful of that. Teaching and preaching and admonishing one another. Giving testimonies. Praying together. All of that is worship. We've made worship an experiential thing, a feeling thing, rather than an intentional, determined, committed act of worship. Spirit and truth. When we worship has become something that I experience rather than something that I give. Does that make sense to you? We say, we say, man, I really, I really felt the presence of God that we really, we really worship today. No, it doesn't matter what you feel. 
It matters what you do and what's in your heart. Now, yes, of course, it's going to produce feelings, but just like love is not a feeling and it produces feelings, worship isn't a feeling. It's not a feeling I get. It's something that I intentionally do. So take the feeling. It doesn't matter whether you felt good or not. If you worship God, you worship God. If you fell at his feet, you fell at his feet. Uh, one commentator said, the, the feel-good experience has replaced the hard discipline of knowing God. He also says, uh, in many congregations, worship has become a spectator sport geared to a generation fashioned by the slick tricks of media. I like that, the slick tricks of media. And Paul summarizes the whole thing. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the name of the Lord just simply means surrender to Jesus Christ and his will. Everything in my life. We need to sit at the feet of Jesus until we are willing to say everything. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, I want it all to be in accordance to your will. Whew. We just raced through a passage of scripture that isn't easy to race through. I want to encourage you to do something. Take this passage this week. Read it and reread it. Meditate upon it. Please don't get up from it thinking, I need to try harder to be good. No, please don't do that. I want you to read the whole chapter from verse 1 through 17. And allow yourself to be overwhelmed with what God has done for you in Jesus. I'm serious. I really want you to do this. What God has done for you in Jesus. And I want you to remain there. I want you to remain there till your heart is full of God's love. I want you to remain there until, until like the disciples, you know, what? how do you think they felt? when that storm was raging around them and the boat was taking on water and Jesus says, why are you afraid? I mean, that seems like the silliest question in the world to me. Here they are about to die and Jesus says, why are you afraid? I want you to stay in those heavenly realities until that place where you come out and you say, I'm not afraid. I'm going to live my life with abandon and vulnerability of the grace of God, and I'm going to allow the Spirit of God to transform me. To heck with rules. The Holy Spirit rules my life. I promise you, I make you this promise, if you'll do that, I truly believe the Holy Spirit will begin to produce his fruit in you in those places of your life where the earthly realities are overriding the heavenly realities. I believe the Holy Spirit will extinguish those desires. I believe the Holy Spirit will cut that limb off and transform you. If we need a summary for how God wants us to live, a, a summary of what it means to put off, get rid of, be clothed with, a summary of our new life, I think it's this. And it comes straight from Jesus. No rules, no traditions that bind us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That takes care of every list we've just gone over. And it's not about rules. It's about loving God and loving each other. And the Holy Spirit will help us do both.